As you may know, I reject the concept of objectivity. And that may sound at first very strange, but if you understand how we come to know anything about reality, then it becomes very clear very quickly that you cannot have any objective knowledge about anything at all. After all, gaining knowledge about anything in reality involves, at the very least, an exchange of photons and during an exchange of photons both the sender and the recipient of the photons do change to some extent. Now of course you can argue that there is it is possible to gain a level of knowledge that can be called practically objective. For example I can state practically objectively that the earth has a satellite called the moon because no matter who you ask if you point at that particular area in the sky they will see the same moon that you will be seeing the only thing of course is that the moon is extremely large compared to us and the few photons that you or i would exchange with the moon would not change it would not make so much of a difference to the moon that it could actually even be measured by any of our instruments. In other words, even though, yes, in principle, at a very basic level, you cannot objectively say anything about the moon, practically speaking, we may as well call it objective knowledge about the moon. But still, at a fundamental philosophical level, there is no such thing as objectivity. There is no way we can separate ourselves completely from the rest of reality or the universe or whatever you want to call it, so that we can make statements, that we can observe that universe, that we can observe that reality without making any difference to it. And that is what would be required for true fundamental objectivity to be true. In order for fundamental objectivity to be true, I should be able to make statements about something without that making any difference whatsoever at all at the most infinitesimal level to whatever it is I'm talking about. And that is clearly, logically and physically impossible. So then, we find ourselves in a conundrum. If we have to reject objectivity at a fundamental level, then doesn't that leave us with a subjective experience of reality in which nothing can be said with any certainty? In other words, where does this leave us with regard to facts? How can we take the concept of fact into a world in which we accept that there is no such thing as true objectivity. And that's a very good one. What actually in that case would be a fact? Can we rescue that term and keep it to mean something that is at least remotely useful? Yes, we can. Obviously, the way we um, colloquially, colloquially understand the word fact is not applicable, cannot be applicable, because a an, an colloquial understanding of the word fact means that something that is true in an objective sense, and we have rejected true fundamental objectivity. So then we have to consider how can we rescue this word in order to still mean something meaningful. And I would say Let's put it in terms of communication with other sentient beings, and specifically, uh, at the moment in any case, uh, primarily, uh, almost exclusively, I would mean by that other human beings. When can I talk about a fact when I'm communicating with another human being? And at a fundamental level, I would say, at the simplest level, I would say a fact is something that I can communicate 
about reality as I experience it in a way that is understood by the person that I can communicate with. So they receive my communication and they feel that they understand my communication. And then within the context of how they understood my communication, they can confirm for themselves that what I am communicating appears to be correct to them. That they experience what I have communicated in a way that is consistent with what I have communicated to them. Sounds all very wishy-washy, but it is actually very straightforward. In other words, if I say to you, there is a cat over there on that sofa, and there is, my cat is sleeping over there, and you were to look at that sofa, in the context of what you understand a cat to be, and a sofa to be, and so on and so forth, you will look at that sofa and say, yep, there is a cat there on that sofa. And you will agree with me. And between us, we have established a fact. The funny thing about that is that this does not exclude, this does not um, preclude the possibility of facts being intersubjective, so to speak. In other words, you and I could both have a similar idea of what a cat and a sofa is, and we could agree between us that there is a cat on the sofa when another person would look at that scene and conclude that, is, that there is a rhinoceros in the bathtub. Okay, that's a very far-fetched and bizarre example, but you catch my drift, I hope. We can be establish between us a mode of communication that we both understand and that we both agree on largely of what we mean when we, when we communicate in that language so to speak and then we can between us agree on something and that then to us to us as a communicating entity becomes an effect so is there any way of making some facts more salient than others, or making some facts more valuable than others, making some facts, in other words, better facts than other facts. And yes, there is. And one way of doing this, and there may be other ways, but one very good way of doing this is through science. And what science actually boils down to in this scenario that I'm painting here, in this context of how I reject objectivity and how I understand facts to be the product of a successful communication between two sentient beings that understand each other, when it comes to science, what we have is, first of all, a very clear and unambiguous language by which we communicate between one scientist and another scientist about what we observe in reality. And because that language is very clear, very precise and very unambiguous, we can communicate things about reality with a very high level of accuracy. And that is represented within the scientific language by the words such as measurement, for example. So when we speak to somebody, in scientific language and of course that means using a formalized description of reality so when we're looking at for example a scientific paper then the english in that paper might not be as important might not be as salient to the information that's being conveyed as the formulas and the the um, formalized language that is presented in the footnotes or in the actual diagrams or whatever else is presented in this scientific paper. That is the fundamental language in which the information is being communicated between all these people who are either scientists or who have trained themselves to understand this scientific language. And that is why scientific language when it comes to facts, 
in a non-objective world, and that doesn't mean a subjective world, as I've explained earlier, is more accurate, more precise, and therefore you can communicate things more clearly, and you can establish, for want of a better word, more solid, harder facts about reality through the scientific language. But there is a flip side, and it would behove us to remain aware of that, even though we don't constantly have to be obsessed by it, but always keep it in the back of our minds. And that is that while language, such as the scientific language, is more formalized, more precise, more accurate, and less ambiguous, don't forget that this might mean that we restrict ourselves as a result of this, as a result of this unambiguity, as a result of the preciseness and accuracy of the language, we may be imposing on ourselves restrictions of what, on what we can actually communicate to another person. For some communications, a more, maybe, poetic expression may be more appropriate. That is not something that should lead anybody to reject scientific conclusions, not at all, because scientific conclusions will always remain valid within the context in which they are reached. But it is just something to keep in mind. Science probably isn't everything when it comes to communication. And that's an interesting thought.